grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Our text for Pentecost Sunday is from the Gospel reading. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his mouth or out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. There are times when we may forget that the Feast of Pentecost is actually much older than the day when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples. Much older than that first day when they went out to the streets proclaiming God's mighty works. Much older than that, that day we consider the birth of the church. Because God had been working for generations through, his Old, Te through this Old Testament celebration in anticipation of that sending of the Spirit to indwell men. We call it Pentecost because it is the harvest celebration that occurs 50 days after, pe after the Passover. But the feast also goes by another name. It is commonly known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, which is a commemoration of the end of the children of Israel's wilderness wandering. It is a remembrance of God's grace and his forgiveness that brought them out of slavery in Egypt, that carried them through their penitential time in the desert and brought them into the promised land. The eight-day celebration was marked by the participants constructing temporary huts or booths out of palm branches to dwell in as a remembrance of their 40-year nomadic journey. And each day, there would be a sacrifice at the temple's altar and it would count down until the final day, which is not as you would expect being a seventh day, but actually the eighth. On that eighth day, a bull, a ram, and seven pure spotless lambs would be sacrificed as an offering that looked to the perfect sacrifice that was promised for the redemption of the world. God had created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. And the eighth day, for all of God's people, was known to be a day of new creation, a fresh start. We are people of the eighth day. We are people of the new creation. The climax of our salvation story began on Holy Week with Jesus triumphantly entering Jerusalem on, sun, on Sunday, the first day. And he did so with palm branches being waved. Which brings us back to remembering the Feast of the Tabernacles, those branches of victory that heralded their entry into the Promised Land. And then, the Holy Week would continue by counting down to the sacrifice of the pure, holy Lamb of God, just as the Feast of Tabernacles did. It counted down to the sacrifice. And it concludes with the ushering in of a new creation on the eighth day. Jesus rose on Easter Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, that eighth day, and we have been in that eighth day ever since that day of resurrection, that day of new birth, as we live in Christ. His resurrection heralded a new creation that is free from the bonds of sin and death, free to live a new life that has been restored to a right relationship with God our Father through his Son. The Apostle Paul tells us in his epistle to the church in Rome that we are united to that new beginning on the eighth day as we were baptized into Christ Jesus, where we die to sin and rise with him to new and everlasting life. Our unity to this new day 
is why Christians shifted their worship from Saturdays to Sundays. And the imagery of a new creation is why many of our baptismal fonts, such as the one we have here at Mount Pisgah, are eight-sided. Did you ever look at it? It's eight-sided. And many of them are that way in order that we would recognize that this is a new beginning, a new start. The eighth day. The day of Christ's resurrection and the day of our rebirth. The Festival of Tabernacles, or Pentecost, was a foreshadowing of the restored creation that God had promised ever since man first fell into sin. And that hope was carried through the generations and recognized and commemorated by God's people as they remembered the deliverance of their forefathers from slavery, the patience and providence of God in the wilderness, and the new life given to them when they entered into the land given to them, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that su supplied all their needs, a land where they would be a people living with God at the center of their life. Yet all of this was only a foretaste of the greater heavenly feast that was to come. And in fact, it is yet to come. We have been delivered from our slavery to sin and death through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Paschal Lamb, and we are currently in the hostile wilderness that seeks to lure us to stray from the narrow path of faith in Christ Jesus. And we are journeying to the greater promised land of the new heaven and the new earth that Christ is preparing for you and me. Pointing to that greater eschatological meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles in our Gospel text, at the celebration of Pentecost prior to his crucifixion, Jesus points to that hope of that new life in him. And so he says on, the, on that final day, that eighth day of the festival, the day of new creation, he stood up and, and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Christ alone is the source of life and salvation to a world parched and dying of thirst in the wilderness of sin and death. But this is not a thirst of the body, but a thirst of the soul that is spiritually distressed by the empty promises of a world that only leaves you more dried up and more lifeless because of the empty promises that just suck life out of you. Like snake oil salesmen, the devil, the world, and our, and our fallen flesh entice us to follow false solutions and every manner of earthly distraction. All this in order to distract us from the truth that we are broken. And so we fill our lives with things to cover it up. But it only leaves us more thirsty. And every time they offer a new solution, we fall for it. Hook line and sinker. Have you ever gone into the grocery store with the intent of purchasing only the good healthy food that you know your body needs? But then you see that display of junk food. Regardless of what our intentions are, we as sinners struggle to resist the very things that kill us the things that make us sick, the things we know are bad for us, and yet we give in to them all the time. The solution is not to keep on adding more of the fallen world to the dead lives we cling to. Rather, we need to be a new creation, reborn, remade in Jesus Christ, and remade completely, not from that which is dead in this sinful wilderness, but rather from the true living water of Christ. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
this new life is the promise that Jesus has made to us and that he delivers through the Holy Spirit, which he sent to dwell with us on that day of Pentecost and who resides with you here and now. We are living in the midst of that eighth day, that new beginning. And although we may not see the ultimate completion of all that has been promised yet, even so, we already, we already are, we know the truth of it and live in the hope of it because we are already experiencing restoration in part. For Christ has given us a foretaste of the life, forgiveness, and grace that awaits us in the greater promised land. Every time you come before the Lord and confess your sins, he makes you new. Every day that you wake and you remember your baptism, how God has called you through the water and the word to be his, you are made new. Every time you come as God's people and join at his table and receive the gifts that God gives you, you are made new. And as the Spirit works in our hearts and our lives through the hearing of God's word, he reshapes us and turns us, from, turns us to looking to what we truly hunger and thirst for, which is the forgiveness and new life in Jesus Christ. He leads us to admit the wretchedness of our sin, confessing it earnestly before God and our neighbor, and then he drives us toward the mercy of his absolution. That very gift that we first saw in its fullness when we came to the baptismal font and you were washed of your sins and you were made one with Christ in it that you may die to sin and rise to new life in him. Here at God's font of grace, new life is poured into us that we may have our thirst quenched through the gift of the Holy Spirit and it comes to us like a life-giving flood. Here the old Adam drowns and the new man, the new creation in Christ, arises. Now does this mean that we are immune to sin and the effects that it causes? Sadly, no. We may even experience them more acutely since we have been made aware of them through the law. But we also know the grace of a God who loves us and who desires our restoration, not our destruction. Jesus defeated sin and death for us on the cross. His blood has redeemed us and, and set us free. We are already new creations in Jesus and justified by grace through faith in him. The Holy Spirit is also at work to sanctify us in the new life that has been given to us. But we will not see the fullness of it until Christ returns and we enter with him into the place that he has prepared for us, the new promised land. Recounting the vision revealed to, to him of the great, greater promised land that is yet to come, the Apostle John writes in the book of Revelation, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the older order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. 
To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. The coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost announced that that final day is coming and we are standing on the verge of it. Therefore thirst for the living water of Christ that wells up to eternal life and receive it where the Holy Spirit is at work to deliver the redemption of Christ that he now offers to you, that he gives you in the hearing of God's word and the reception of his gifts in the sacraments. And may that new life that moved the disciples on the day of Pentecost to tell forth the mighty works of God in Christ Jesus also move you to share that good news by ordinary and extraordinary means that, that by going and proclaiming it, you may also quench the thirst of others who need to be refreshed in Christ. And may the new life in Christ flow through you and in you, now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus for life and salvation. Amen.